So I want to talk to you about um, the pretentious approach to analytic number theory, which um, Sandaraj and I have been developing over the last five years. And um, some of you were at the summer school we had some years ago and have access to the book that never appeared um, on the subject. So for those of you who don't know much about it, let me explain what this is all about. So. The approach, the general approach to analytic number theory stems back to Riemann's memoir from 1859 and involves studying the distribution of zeros of the Riemann zeta function. And as we know, it's been a very profitable approach to L functions and, and naturally arising questions in arithmetic for a long time. And yet many theorems have been proved without zeros of L functions. And to a certain extent, the, uh, the community has said, well, those approaches are ad hoc and looked down upon a little bit, the, particularly, the, if you like, the elementary work championed by Paul Erdos. And many of the great theorems of analytic number theory, especially about the distribution of prime numbers, come from so-called ad hoc approaches. So a few years ago, um, Sandra and I had been uh, using certain techniques that we call pretentious, and I'll try and explain what pretentious means in these lectures, to prove theorems on open questions to try and, try and develop the subject. And um, we were interested in what, we started to become interested perhaps in what established theorems could be proved by these pretentious methods. And we attended a lecture by Henrik Evanietz in Princeton five years ago, where he announced the proof by himself and Friedlander of Linux theorem that in every arithmetic progression where there can be primes, there's a relatively small prime. And Evanietz's proof avoided many of the deep difficulties about zeros of L functions that all the previous proofs had, or Evanietz and Friedlander's proof avoided these deep ideas about zeros of L functions that had previously been part of the very difficult proofs of um, Linux theorem. Though the proof of Friedlander and Vanietz is not easy itself, but it technically avoids these tremendous difficulties. And if you like, is an elementary proof, albeit a very hard elementary proof. So it gave us courage to say, well, maybe these techniques we've been working on could prove everything in classical analytic number theory. So we set ourselves that goal, and the first goal was maybe we should try and prove Linux theorem ourselves, and we did. We, we surprised ourselves that we had some ideas for a technique, and they worked. And we gave a pretty short proof of Linux theorem, much, certainly much easier than what existed at that time in the literature. And um, we wrote up, if you like, what we could do in proving the classical results of what you might find, particularly in Davenport, and then in Bombieri's large Civ book. And um, we were able to accomplish quite a bit, but there were some clear flaws in what we had. Most importantly was that we couldn't get a good error term in the prime number theorem. So I'll, I'll remind you of what we know about the prime number theorem in a moment, but the number of primes up to x being something like x over log x. And um, we, couldn't, we could achieve an error term that was little o of x over log x, and x over log x is some power, but we couldn't even get that power to be 2. So we were unable to prove that number of primes up to x was x over log x plus big O of x over log squared x. Our methods failed us on that. So that was one big flaw in what we were doing. And that flaw has a knock-on effect because if you try and prove a bombieri vinogradov theorem, which is central to many of the developments in analytic number theory, then you need to be able to win in the prime number theorem and the prime number theorem for arithmetic progressions by an arbitrary power of log x. So an error term of log x, big O of x over log x, so the A is what you need. The second thing was that, that the, the subject, and I'll explain all this, centers around what's called Holas's theorem. And the proof of Holas's theorem, or Holas's proof, is a little opaque. Um, 
It's a little hard to really understand the motivation behind it. And after Hollas, there have been many improvements to his results. In fact, we had a paper improving his results. But all of them started with the same fundamental construction that was somewhat opaque. And this meant a lot of the proofs that we have, well, they worked, but they're rather difficult to understand why they worked in a sort of a, a larger setting. Now, these I would regard as what were the two main flaws in, in the book we kind of wrote up three years ago. And what's happened in the meantime is that those, those flaws have both been removed. And not by us, but one by Dmitry Kukulopoulos, who's here, um, who showed us how to prove the prime number theorem, not only a strong version of prime number theorem, but as strong as can be done by classical methods. And um, more recently, Adam Harper came up with a new proof of Hollas's theorem that oh, it's not incredibly easy, but it allows one to sort of appreciate what's going on and makes it much easier to use the techniques. So in both cases, um, we've tried to further develop a theory, developed what Kukulopoulos did and Harper did. And so that's what I'm going to explain to you here, uh, these developments that now means that we feel we have a strong theory that rivals the classical theory. And, um, well, maybe I should embarrass Sandarajan by saying, well, get the book out in nine months. But no, we, we've got to work on it and get it out. There are people here I know who would love to see it out so that they can use the ideas. So um, it will take some writing because there's a lot of things they're doing. And then um, people like Maxine keep on proving consequences that one would like to use. So it makes it difficult to write a book when people prove nice theorems um, to get it finished, the book. Anyway, so let me, uh, let me read, change the title because both of these new proofs um, come down to sort of doing something a little bit surprising. And I'll call this Perron's Formula Revisited. So that's really going to be my title for the three talks. And in these talks, what I hope to do, if I have time, is prove to you or show you how the proof of the prime number theorem goes the strongest form, Vinogradov Korobov form, um, give you the new proof of Hollas's theorem and explain what Hollas's theorem is, and hopefully prove Linux theorem um, in a way that hopefully you can understand. So it won't, won't use anything very deep. OK, so um, what I want to do is start with the classical proof of the prime number theorem. And I'm going to assume that you know it already. Now, when, I, when one says one knows the proof of the prime number theorem, there's very few people who could actually just write it out. Because although the ideas are very elegant, they really are, you have to go through a lot of steps. And you have to make a lot of estimates work in order to make the, prime, the proof of the prime number theorem work. So I'm just going to quickly go through it, maybe in the next 20 minutes, the proof. Well, and some of the notions that go into the usual proof of the prime number theorem will come into what we're doing. So um, let's just start off with basic definitions. So um, lambda n, it's just a convenient weight that we, what we want to do is count primes. And so we want to wait 0 if n is not a prime. And in fact, it's convenient to count prime powers for technical reasons. And um, if n is a prime power, we count p. This is van Mangold's function, as it's called. And um, it fits lots of formulas. So um, to do the prime number theorem, instead of counting the primes, we count them with this weight. And instead of uh, x over log x expected with some error term, or really the integral dt over log t, we expect the main term of x. And then the question is, what error term? And so let me just give 2, or maybe 3. So we get big O of x to the half log squared x if we assume the Riemann hypothesis. So we'll get into the Riemann hypothesis a little later today. And um, the best result known is due to um, Karabov and Vinogradov. And it's log x to the 3 fifths over log log x to the 1 fifth. So this is unconditional. And that's the best result known up to the constants. And then um, the one you've seen in the textbooks, if you've worked through the proof, would be something like this. OK? 
Okay, so we'll, we'll more or less give all the details of the proof of that today, and um, we'll indicate where you, how you get this. Okay, so we can get that. I didn't say that. <laughs> okay, so um, let's just remember Perron's formula. So this is a beautiful idea for um, recognizing an inequality amongst integers. And very simply, so this is if the real part of C is greater than 0. And something happens in between. Anyway, the important thing is that, um, well, it's the average in between. The important thing is that we have a way of recognizing inequalities for positive real numbers using this integral. And um, hopefully, you've played with it before. So um, you prove it just in the standard way of pulling the contour to the right or left. And um, you either get the pole at s equals 0, which leads you to this. And the value on the contour, the added contours, is small. Or you pull it to the right, in this case, and there's no pole. And the value on the added contours is small. So um, it's not very useful to have an integral going all the way to infinity. So what one wants to do is truncate this at some height. And then one can um, work out an error term for that, um, which looks like y to the c. This is all. You'll find this, for instance, in Davenport's book. So this is if y is not equal to 1. And then if y equals 1, you get some 1 over t. I guess c over t. So um, the point is that, well, these you can work out the point at which you can truncate and not have to worry about the error term. I'm not going to get spend much time thinking about that. You're just going to have to trust me. There is a point. But again, I'm sure you've played with the proof of the prime number theorem and know that's the case. So what is the key application of Perron's formula? Thanks to uh, Riemann, I guess. If we uh, wish to look at the sum of a n, n up to x, and let me just assume, for, we have, always have this problem with y equals 1 that it's a bit weird. So let me just assume x is not an integer, so I, I can be correct and not have to write extra. Then the way we try and sum a sequence of interesting numbers, a n up to x, is we write it as a sum over all integers times 1 if n is less than or equal to x and 0 if n is greater than x. But I'm going to rewrite that as x over n is greater than 1 or x over n is less than 1. OK, so the idea is then you can just plug in what we've got up there. OK, we take y equals x over n. And when we plug in y equals x over n, we've got an infinite sum and an infinite integral, if I do the thing at the top. So the point having a little flexibility with the c is we can pull it far enough to the right that we can make things absolutely convergent, and so swap the order of the integral and the summation. And so we end up with 1 over 2i pi. Well, let's have a look what's inside the integral. Um, So I've got a n, and I plug in for here y equals x over n. So it's x to the s over n to the s. So the part that's sort of interesting that varies with n is this. And the rest is x to the s over s ds. OK, and so what we can replace, we'll just call this thing a of s. And so this is um, the application of this formula that is most useful in number theory. 
So in order to understand the sum of something arithmetic, say up to x, all we need to do is understand the integral of a Dirichlet series times something on an infinite line. So you could argue we've taken a nice finite discrete combinatorial problem made into a hard analysis problem, but sometimes that's useful. OK, so um, the uh, most famous application will be for the, um, we want to work for lambda n's. And all you have to do to the, um, if you go to the real part of s greater than 1, then you write out zeta s as the sum of 1 over n to the s. You write it as the Euler product over the primes. Then when you're over in the domain of absolute convergence, you can do things like logarithmic derivatives. And this is what comes out when you do the calculation carefully. So now we can just apply the formula over there. And we find that the sum n up to x of lambda n equals um, 1 over 2 i pi, the integral. Well, let me just curtail it in all in one go. Just believe me that you can for some suitable t um, minus zeta prime s over zeta s. x to the s over s ds. And actually, I'll just say what the right error term is, something like this when you do all that. So again, this is all standard. Um, oh, there should be a plus log x, because I was careless what happens when you're at the integer. <clears throat> OK, so what's the game now is we have the integral of a rather hairy function. And we have it to the right of 1, because we're doing our manipulations where you can uh, do manipulations without too much worry, where everything's absolutely convergent. And again, we want to play complex analysis. So what we're going to do to this is we're going to pull it to the left. And the hope as we got this integral up to height t is, well, we'll create an integral like this. And um, the hope is that these integrands are nice and small the value of the, the integral on those integrands. And then everything will be picked up by um, Cauchy's theorem, which is the residues of the poles of the integrand inside here. So we'll talk a little bit about the whether or not it's easy to prove that um, the integral on these lines are small but in a minute. But let's just think about the poles of the integrand. So what are the poles of poles of this? Well, the room zeta function, I'm not going to get into this, but um, as I hope you know, is meromorphic. It's got a pole of order 1 and s equals 1. It's the only pole. So at s equals 1, zeta s looks like um, 1 over s minus 1 plus gamma plus that when s tends towards 1. Okay, That's the uh, expansion for zeta. And so that's the only pole. Now, OK, why am I saying that? Well, let's have a look. What are the poles of this thing? Well, x to the s has no poles. 1 over s, there's a pole at s equals 0, but that's pretty benign. We'll think about that in a minute. Zeta prime over zeta. We're either going to have a pole of zeta prime or a 0 of zeta. The poles of zeta prime are the same as the poles of zeta, because zeta is meromorphic. And then the zeros of zeta, well, they're the zeros of zeta. So what do we have? We have. Um, the pole at s equals 1. And so the pole at s equals 1 gives us what? Um, well, if, if there's a pole of order 1 at s equals 1, zeta prime over zeta has a pole of order 1 at s equals 1, residue minus 1. So that minus 1 times minus 1 is 1. Plug in s equals 1 to here, we get x over 1. So that gives us a residue x. At s equals 0, we have the residue minus zeta prime 0 over zeta 0. And um, otherwise, we've got s equals rho, where zeta of rho equals 0. And those are the possible poles. Okay, So this, these two we can handle easily. This requires more thought. 
So this is the difficulty and uh, the, the main difficulty in Riemann's approach is understanding these guys. Right? That's, that's what's difficult and it's still pretty mysterious how to understand these guys. <clears throat> so what happens if you have a pole of order m? Here, when we take s prime over s, we get m over s minus rho. Yeah? And so minus m over s minus rho. Typically, when we write the formula, we act as if we've got m separate zeros, which makes it beautiful to write that the formula becomes x minus the sum over these rows of x to the rho over rho, counting m times, if it's a zero of order m, minus zeta prime zero over zeta zero. You can actually prove this exact formula if you let t go to infinity. But what's more convenient for us is not letting t go to infinity. And then we get the same error term. OK, so this is all very standard. If you know this well, sorry, but I thought it's, it is a school, so it's worth going over for everybody. Are you kind of trivial zeros in that sum? So there, there are lots of zeros, perhaps, to the right of 1. And there's the bunch we all talk about in the critical strip, but there are some along the real axis going back here also. So I, yeah, maybe I have to be a little bit careful depending on how far back I take the contour, but it's not really going to affect things. OK, so now the question is, can we make this argument work? Now, you have to think things through, like, for instance, when you try and pull the contour across here, what if you happen to bump into a zero of the Riemann zeta function as you go? Then you're going to hit a pole of this, so it's not going to be so easy to just bound the integrand. So what's a good idea, it seems to me, is you take, if there are two zeros of the Riemann zeta function, is you take your contours so you sneak your way halfway in between them. Now, is that easy to do? Yeah, it's easy to do because what you can prove, it takes some work, is that the number of zeros up to height t is some constant t over log t, which means there's kind of an average gap between zeros of 1 over log t, or 2 pi over log t, in fact. So somewhere there's going to be such a gap around there, and you just go halfway between two zeros, and that allows you to avoid the problem of stepping on a pole. So when you do that, you can get some idea of the size of zeta prime over zeta, and um, well, to cut a long story short, in this kind of region, so the real part of S between minus 1 and 2, you can have something like minus zeta prime S over zeta S um, is dominated by, well, it's not perhaps not surprising, zeta prime over zeta should be something like the sum of 1 over S minus rho. Yeah? I mean, that's what appears in the formula over there. And so this is dominated by the s minus rows that are close in. So in other words, the, the rows, this is the sum over the zeros row, such that s minus rho is less than 1. And you can prove plus some sort of error term. So with this sort of estimate, you can work with zeta prime over zeta. Um, let me not get into that too much. So what I want to do is just focus on the um, formula here and see what we can deduce from it. So, um, oh, the sum, of course, oh, we have said psi x over there. So um, we want to bound, we want to bound the error, psi x minus x. And the main thing here is the sum of x to the rho over rho. And what would be nice is to be clever enough to find some cancellation between the terms for different zeros. But unfortunately, we don't really know how to do that. So the best we can sort of do is something like the sum over these rows of the absolute value of x to the row over the absolute value of rho, plus, well, that's a constant, the zeta prime 0 is 8, 0. So we just need to worry about this guy. And I guess I'll take t in a range just so that I don't have to but I'll simplify things as we go along. Now. The reason I write this down is simply just to note that the absolute value of x to the rho is x to the real part of rho. Yeah, because if rho is sigma plus it, you can forget the x to the it. It has absolute value 1. Using the fact that the number of zeros up to height t is like t log t, and also one can show there are no zeros of the Riemann zeta function very close in to the axis, one can show that um, the sum of these zeros up to height t is 
uh, less than log squared, which is partial summation. And so what we end up with here is a bound on this term, which is like x to the maximum part of real row in this range, rho such that the part of, imaginary part of rho is less than or equal to t times log squared t plus the second term. So this is the key calculation in getting the error term in the prime number theorem. And um, well, you can see very clearly that what's really important is how big do the zeros get in this box? How, what it's, how big the real parts of zeros get? Now, um, what would be convenient is that um, all the zeros, which is, well, we certainly know there are zeros on the half line. In fact, billions of them have now been calculated to be on the half line. So if we believe a conjecture that billions of zero, that all the zeros are on the half line, so if all, oh, that's fun, if all rho satisfy real part of rho equals a half, or less than or equal to a half, because there are some zeros further to the left, then, well, here we've got x to the half times log squared. Okay, if we pick t as root x, and this would also be x to the half times log squared, so then take t equals root x, and we get an error term, well, what we said over here, x to the half times log squared x on the Riemann hypothesis. So under the assumption that all of the zeros lie on the half line or to the left. Um, so what we're going to look at it in a bit is um, what happens with other zero for regions. Maybe I'll just say, do it rather than um, leave us around. So what we'll eventually prove is something like the real part of rho in this box if the imaginary part of um, rho is less than or equal to t, then the real part of rho is less than 1 minus some constant over log t. Okay? And if we can do that and we just plug it in, let's just forget the logs. So these are the main terms up to the logs. And then if we want to Max, minimize this rather, the way to do it is to equate the x of c over log t with the x over t. That'll require us to take something like t as um, exponential of root log x. And then when we plug that in, we'll get the standard error term one gets in the textbooks. And then um, this error term requires a better zero free region, so going somewhat further than c over log t. OK, so what matters to proving the prime number theorem uh, is the zero free region. And um, let's just talk a little bit about how one goes about this. So the, uh, the first step, if you like, is to show that um, you can't get zeros on the one line and then to come in a little bit. So the um, standard proof, if you like, um, I'm not sure how I want to say this. So let's suppose that zeta 1 plus i t was 0. Okay, then we have something like what? The product of 1 minus 1 over p to the 1 plus i t to the minus 1, 0. And what is this kind of telling us? Um, You've got the sort of 1 over p weight, and you've got this p to the i t. And arguably, it's telling us something about the way the p to the i t's tend to point, if this was to be the case. So um, if I was to take, say, um, absolute value of, no, how do I want to do this? So I guess what I want to say is that if the p to the i t's predominantly pointed towards 1 or the positive real direction, then you might expect this to look something like 1 plus 1 over 1 minus 1 over p to the minus 1, so it would go to infinity. So there's a way in which one thinks that p to the it points predominantly in the other direction. Okay, that's the way we force it to go to zero. So if it averaged out that it sort of didn't point in any direction, you might expect this to sort of be a constant, a bit like those L function calculations 
in the previous lecture. But if, I always hate writing in this form. So this is approximately 1 plus p to the minus i t over p. So yeah, so if the p to the i t's look like they're pointing towards the positive direction primarily, then these have size typically bigger than 1. Okay, so the overall product might go to infinity. But the overall product here is going to 0, so we expect them to pro predominantly point in the negative direction. Predominantly is a very vague term that I'm going to make less vague in a minute. Um, and then, so this is actually how Davenport talks about things before he goes to Matten's proof. If that's the case, if the PTITs tend to point in the negative real direction, then the P to the 2 ITs, after all it's a square, tend to point in the direction of minus 1 squared. But then that kind of tells us that we should expect zeta of 1 plus 2 IT to have a pole for that to diverge towards infinity. But as I said, fairly simple considerations, the Riemann zeta function tells us the only poles are at s equals 1. So this is sort of a standard heuristic to finish off the proof of the prime number theorem. And um, this is proved nicely using a clever identity of Maten in probably the treatments that you've read. But this is, if you look at both de Lavalle, Poussin, Adamard, essentially they're trying to capture this idea in their proofs. And it was Maten came later. And you know, the proof of the cosine identity, that came afterwards. So what I want to do is go back to this original heuristic and try and understand it a little better. So to do that, um, I'm going to make a definition. I guess I'll use the bottom of this board. So for coefficients a n greater than 0, greater than or equal to 0, let me define the distance between two functions. Maybe I've done this in too much generality, but um, bear with me. It'll be this thing. So this is not exactly a distance function. Maybe I should just cut to the chase of the, the simplest example, which would be if we take a n to be 1 over p if n is a prime and 0 otherwise. So the whole thing works. Um, in some generality. And um, what's the idea going to be? The idea is that we have two multiplicative functions f and g, both inside the unit circle. And this is some sort of measure of how close f and g are to each other. So if f and g were to be equal and also to lie on the unit circle, then f g conjugate would be 1 everywhere. And so 1 minus 1 would be 0. And this so-called distance function is 0. It's not quite a distance function, because if f equal g and we're inside the unit circle, then this wouldn't actually equal 0. But there's something good about this definition is that it satisfies a triangle inequality. And that's what's really going to be relevant to us, is that, um, well, there's several forms of triangle inequality. Let me just give a traditional one. So it satisfies this. Um, I have a preprint on the archive quite recently, which is for the celebration of 150 100th or 150th anniversary of the Math Association of America, where I try and describe some of these ideas. And there's a competition there to find the best proof of this. So we didn't like our proof very much. Had three entries so far, one of which is very good, I think. Anyway, um, have a look there if you like elementary identities on the archive. Where is the dependence on x on x? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Thank you. How 
I got that one too high, this middle one. Probably. Oh, okay. okay, so what's the point of this in this context? So the log of the Riemann zeta function at s is, we can think to the right of s, is the sum over the prime powers of uh, 1 over m p to the m sigma times p to the minus i m t. So here I'm putting s as sigma plus i t. Okay. So if I look at log zeta sigma, um, actually, let me, sorry. Okay, so I just want to consider this natural quantity. Then, um, that's the same as we said before. When you take the absolute value of something, you can sort of take the real part upstairs. So that's the real part of the log um, of zeta sigma over zeta s. And then if we just use this formula, what do we get? Well, s and sigma have this part the same. So we get the sum over the prime powers of 1 over m p to the m sigma and then for the zeta sigma, this is t is 0, so this is just 1. And for the other part, we have that. Now, if you look at our definition up there, it looks pretty similar. And if you like, this is comparing with the appropriate set of weights. This is them. The distance between 1 and n to the it all the way to infinity. So the triangle inequality will give us simply that well you can write that as And then, just by the definition up there, the fg prime, I can write, rewrite the second one as just divide out by the same function on the unit circle, i n to the it. I can just write it like that. So in other words, this is equal to 2 times the distance between 1 and n to the it. Infinity? Thank you. So now what am I going to do with this? I'll simply square this. So. I get myself in here, substitute in these, and then we get back, well, almost um, a slight fail. We almost get back um, Matens inequality. We actually get this thing. OK, so all I'm doing here is I'm squaring. So this is d squared. Over there is, is less than or equal to 4 times the d squared over there. I'm substituting from the line above. You know, sigma plus i t and sigma plus 2 i d. And when the smoke clears, this is what you get, taking exponentials. So Matens, I'll just remind you of how Maten works in a minute. But in Maten, you get a plus 4 there. So this wasn't quite what we wanted. But actually, that's not very hard to re repair because um, I could go through the same thing again, and um, in order to get a plus for that, I could get the inequality, sort of purposely taking you away from zeta functions here.
sorry, twice that. So exactly the same argument, you see, and then the square of the minus sign doesn't really matter. And when you work it back, that would put a minus sign in here, that would put zeta s up here, and we get a plus four here. Okay, again, just trust me that the algebra works, you can verify that yourselves, but, um, so this distance function is a somewhat flexible tool to create inequalities, and then Maten's famous result, famous proof, says that if you had a zero here, as you go at one plus i t, as you come in towards one from the right, this is because it's, a, it's an analytic function, this is gonna look like sigma minus one to some integer power to the four, so at, at least sigma minus one to the four, this is one over sig minus, minus one to the three. So together we get a sigma minus, at least a sigma minus one. The only way this whole thing could be greater than or equal to one as sigma goes to one is that this compensates by looking like one over sigma minus one, but then we have a pole here which is impossible. So that's Maten's beautiful argument to finish off the proof. This is sort of a segue between the heuristic that everybody used and the eventual proof. Okay, I can see I better not get into everything I was hoping to get into. So um, let me uh, oh, I've rubbed out what I wanted, of course. So let's go back to um, the beginning of this proof. It does stop in the middle, right? The outside board? Or was that just a big mistake? <laughs> <laughs> Looks like my work is lighter than sounds. <laughs> oh well, what can you do? Okay, so going back, we, uh, we had psi of x is um, the integral, 1 over 2i pi, the integral on from c minus i infinity, or c minus i t to c plus i t of um, uh, minus zeta prime s over zeta s, x the s over s ds, and as we said, in order to make this work, we had c to the right of one, so c greater than one, plus some error term. Let's not worry about too much about the error terms. And the tactic of Riemann, so now we're gonna get in more into pretentiousness. If you like, the tactic of Riemann is that you take this, this contour to the right of one and you shove it back to the left, you do the residues. It's all very elegant and beautiful. Some technical issues that need to be resolved, but, but a wonderful proof. So the new approach is, why don't we just look at this and try and bound this thing? Why, why, why do all this contour integration? Why move the contours? How big is this thing? Okay, so I wanna make one sort of step that's gonna make life easier, is that when we're trying to count the primes up to x, the technique we use doesn't use primes bigger than x. Yeah, we went to looking into that. So I'm gonna slightly change zeta um, I'm going to regret this later, but in the next lecture I'll have a different meaning for this notation. But zeta xs will just be the sum 1 over n to the s. Um, p divides n implies p is less than or equal to x. Okay, so this is a nice finite thing. It has an Euler product. So in the argument we use, there was no reason not to use this thing, right? Because it'll just give you the primes up to, or the prime powers, for all the primes up to x and their prime powers. So we'll work with this. There's a reason for that, um, as you'll see in one second. And now let's just take absolute values here and see what we've got. So what's the absolute value of the right-hand side? So this is less than or equal to taking absolute values. We get 1 over 2 pi, some sort of integral. Um, and I'll change, I'll do something with the limits in a minute, but um, let me just say zeta prime of c. Let me change um, 
let me write um, S as C plus I little t. Okay, so this goes from minus t to plus t. Zeta prime over zeta. Um, x to the C. When we take absolute values of x to the C plus it, we get x to the C. And in the denominator, we get something like C plus the absolute value of t dt. Something along those lines. Well, to a constant. So maybe a 2 here. So the x to the c is a little bit of a worry, because that we know that the right size of this is about x, right? So the x to the c is a bit of a worry. So let's, as is typical in these contours, let's just pick c a tiny bit bigger than 1. So that x to the c is conveniently some well-known constant times x. OK, so this is less than, less than. Well, I mean, there's various ways we could play this game. We've got this x, constants we're not worried about. We've got some integral, with zeta prime over zeta, very complicated zeta prime over zeta. Let's just take the maximum of it, of zeta x prime. And then some integral that looks more, c is very close to 1. So this looks something like this. OK? So how big are these two terms? Well, this one's easy. This is just like a log, maybe 2 log, but you'll forgive me the 2. Um, how big is this guy? Well, I'm really going to be very crude and say, um, well, zeta prime over zeta looks like the sum of lambda <laughs> <laughs> forget that. The sum of lambda n over n to the c. Yeah, forget the it. And we'll do this for n up to x. It's not 100% correct. There should be a few more terms, but they're not going to be important. The c is more or less 1, so it's certainly less than lambda n over n up to x. So it's less than log x. OK. So by doing something completely stupid, which is just take absolute values, how much have we lost? The right answer is x plus an error term. And we've lost by a log x and a log t. And t, well, we chose it to be x to the half before. We might be a bit more judicious now about the choice of t. In fact, we'll take t to be a power of log. So actually, let me be careful what I say. Let's just leave, let me not say that. Let's, t might well be um, more complicated than that. But we've only lost by some powers of log. So that's surprisingly good for such a crude argument. So another approach to perhaps working on the prime number theorem is let's just try and be a little less crude here and see where we get to. OK. So um, I'm so confused with these boards. Um, OK, I guess that one's next, if it'll stay down for me. OK, so we've done this crude argument, and we haven't done any analysis at all. So note we're integrating to the right of the one line. We're not straying into the critical strip. So the first question we should ask is if we've got a function which, say, zeta, let's assume zeta prime over zeta is a fairly benign function, which it actually is. 1 over s is certainly benign. Um, x to the s we certainly understand. What I want to understand is we know the right answer is x, so we know there must be some cancellation in this integral. So where does it come from? Well, there's an obvious place it comes from. Well, think about the terms. The only term that we really understand very well, besides the 1 over s that we understand well, is x to the s. And what happens to the integral of x to the s as we go through a short interval? Well, the integral of x to the s over s is x to the s over log x. But um, more importantly, really, for us is if we go through from s0 to s0 plus what? 2 pi over log x, 2i pi over log x. So we go over a short integral, short part of the integral up the vertical axis, then that difference is 0. OK, so in very short intervals of length 1 over log x, the x to the s part disappears. So there's a win there. We just have to learn how to exploit it. How do we exploit the cancellation thanks to 
actually, yes, rotating fast. So what's the obvious way to exploit that? Well, integration by parts will allow us to first integrate the x to the s, and then hopefully the rest won't get too nasty when we differentiate it. OK, so if I was working with, now I'm going to switch back to another notation, um, which is over there. So if I'm integrating a of s, x to the s over s, so here a of s is zeta prime over zeta, OK? Then what's the idea now is I'm going to integrate by parts. So it'll be a to the s over s, the integral of x to the s, OK? Which, in other words, is x to the s over log x, integrating by parts. And then we've got minus the two other terms. So minus the integral of a prime s over log x, x to the s over s, plus the integral of a of s over x to the s over s squared over log x. OK, I haven't put limits there. Let's not worry about limits. What's going to happen because of this circulating around so much is we can basically consider that to be 0. And we, if, well, if we go to infinity, that's certainly an identity. And actually, to study this as an identity, let's just take this and go back over here. So we know this represents the sum a n n up to x. What happens in this first term here? What is a prime of s? What is the derivative of a Dirichlet series? Well, this is the sum of a n over n to the s. So minus a prime of s is the sum a n log n over n to the s. Yeah. So this first term corresponds to the sum a n log n over log x. Well, I think you can guess what the second part represents. And in fact, this is sort of a standard trick in using Perron's formula. OK, so this part actually is easily bounded. Now, assume all the ANs are less than or equal to 1, which is not quite true in our problem, but is almost true in that the average of a lambda ns is bounded by 1. Then when we, we can just take an absolute bound of this with 1 here. So the sum 1 minus log n over log x. And this thing is less than x over log x. OK, that's just if so. In other words, if I'm just putting a 1 in here, then this would be x minus log x factorial over log x, and then by Sterling's formula, in fact, that the main term is x over log x. So the meat of this integral here, the thing we want, this is small. I mean, we win by one log x anyway. The meat of it lives in here. So let's just examine what we get out of this integral um, as opposed to before. So before. I was in, when I was integrating this thing and taking absolute values, I had something like the maximum in my interval of a of s times x. So here again, I'm thinking of s as 1 plus 1 over log x plus i t. And I'm thinking of an integral from minus t to plus t um, times log t. Yeah, that's basically what I had up there, right, with zeta. And now what do I have? Well, I have something a little different when I make the same. So this is the bound that I get by taking absolute values in this integral. Now I've integrated by parts one time, and I try to do the same thing. What is it that I get out of this thing when I take absolute values? I still get the x. I'm actually going to pull out the same thing, the maximum of a of s. Excuse me? Are you going to put your prime on the side? Yes. Um, there's an extra log x I can bring outside. That's cool. Because remember, this is bounded by log x. And I divided through by the log x. That's cool. Not less than, less than. And now I've got inside this integral from minus t to t of a prime over a in absolute value of 1 plus 1 over log x plus i t over dt over 1 plus t. So 
have I won or have I lost? It's a bit hard to tell. <laughs> I've made it more complicated at the very least. That's good. Um, so here, um, what can I do? Well, um, for instance, bounding this, I could Cauchy it. I could Cauchy it, because a prime over a is kind of hard, but a prime over a squared, it's easy to play with. Terry looks like he's in pain from me saying that. But anyway, so um, one idea to get upper bounds would be to expand it in that way. Um, perhaps I don't want to get into that at this stage, but suffice to say that proceeding like this, you can, for instance, in this problem and in other interesting problems, reduce this bound to root log x from log x by this. So there is a win. Okay, trust me on this. So um, this is something we're going to get into more when we get into Harper's new proof of Hollas's theorem is how you can win by doing such things. But this actually, well, I guess I'm running out of time today. Um, this is going to come in now. So let me actually, let me finish off by something fun. So what we're going to do is we're going to revisit the proof of the prime number theorem. We're going to do it to the right of one. We're going to do it by taking absolute values, though we're going to be a little bit more clever about how we construct the integral. But um, we're going to do it to a slightly different function from the standard function. So OK, if, you can be, if you've been lost up to now, this bit is kind of fun to come back to. So um, I said that zeta s looks like 1 over s minus 1 plus gamma plus big O of s minus 1 when you're near to 1. And it's, you know, it's got a Taylor series from then on. So this would give us for zeta prime s, well, you just differentiate, right? Minus 1 over s minus 1 plus s minus 1 squared plus big O 1. Okay. And then zeta, what I'm trying to get to is minus zeta prime s over zeta s. How does that start? That starts with um, a 1 over s minus 1 plus gamma. Plus gamma? Yeah. No. Minus gamma. Yeah. OK, so that's just a calculation based on this series. Now, what we want to do in the proof of the prime number theorem is integrate zeta prime over zeta. And the whole issue becomes, for the main term, becomes the pole at s equals 1. But in the problem we're working on, we want to actually get upper bounds on the integrand to the right of 1. So somehow we want to get rid of that pole at s equals 1. So here's a nice way to do it. Let's just look at zeta prime s over zeta s plus zeta s. So that's that minus that. <laughs> the pole's gone. Okay. If I subtract 2 gamma, this is at s equals 1, it even vanishes. Okay. So I want to play with this function. Now let's see what's kind of neat about this function. Now it has no pole at s equals 1. Right? We've just canceled it out. But let's have a look at the zeros. So what, actually, what I want to say is, what are the poles of this? Now, we, are, we know that the poles of zeta s, well, the poles of this must be at least the pole of one of the terms. There's no poles of gamma. The only pole of zeta s is at s equals 1. That canceled with the poles of zeta prime over zeta. So, the s equals 1 isn't a pole. Neither of these terms contribute a pole. What are the remaining poles? We said the only poles for zeta prime over zeta are the poles s equals 1 and the zeros of zeta s. But they remain poles here because there's nothing doing with these other terms. So the poles of this equal the zeros of zeta s. So one way to phrase the Riemann hypothesis, instead of looking for zeros of Riemann zeta function, we could look for poles of this guy. And this is the guy we're going to put into Perron's formula tomorrow. But for today, I just want to play, finish off by playing with this. So if you're a good analyst, you might have good ways of tracking zeros. But if you're like me, the only thing you know that's easier to do is to show something's not a pole. Because something's not a pole means it doesn't diverge to infinity, which is relatively, relatively easy to do. So we have this function. I'm going to call this function z of s. 
And um, the Riemann hypothesis then can be rephrased. Z of S has no poles with real part of S greater than a half. All right. And what I want to do is think about a technique that would allow me to prove that. Huh. That's the, oh, no, it's not staying. OK. Well, anyway, off it goes. So, um, so how can we prove that a function has no poles in a certain ball, say? Well, one way to do that is, at a certain point, is if you have a Taylor expansion with a certain radius of convergence, then the thing converges. It doesn't have a pole. So how about this for an idea? Here's the half line. And I want z of s to have no poles to the right of a half. But I only want to play with z of s to the right of 1. So here is z of s. And I want to, what I'm going to do is try and build a Taylor series for z of s at every point to the right of 1. And I want to prove that z of s doesn't have a pole there. Well, if I can just get radius of convergence a half, for every point here, I can include every point to the right of a half. Yeah, so every point to the right of a half, I go sort of half minus epsilon, just enough to skip over the one line. And then hopefully, it'll be within the ball of convergence there. So the Riemann hypothesis can be said to say, or Riemann hypothesis can be is implied by z of s 0 um, has, z of s has a Taylor series with radius convergence at least a half um, for all s with real part of s greater than 1. So now suddenly, I've got the Riemann hypothesis living to the right of 1. So how do you prove that a Taylor series has a certain radius of convergence? Well, when you write it out, You write it out, well, in terms of the Taylor coefficients, obviously. Etc. So I want the s minus s zeros to go up to a half. So this grows like a half to the k. I can make this converge if this grows a little bit smaller than 2 to the k. Or actually, if it grows like 2 to the k, then I can get a, any radius of convergence less than a half. And that'll be enough, obviously, an open interval. So here's my new Riemann hypothesis is zks0, zks over k factorial, where s is sigma plus it for all s equals sigma plus it with sigma greater than 1. That is bounded by something that depends only on s times 2 to the k. So if I can just take these derivatives, high derivatives of zeta prime over zeta, of zeta, and well, gamma we know how to do high derivatives of, obviously. But if the first two terms, I can do high derivatives of them, bound them this well, then I'm going to prove the Riemann hypothesis. OK, so this is what we call the pretentious Riemann hypothesis. Again, I haven't told you why pretentious, but. And let me just say that if you assume the Riemann hypothesis, then just by classical techniques, the Riemann hypothesis implies that Three plus t. So, although all we need to assume is that there's some bound with a fixed constant for each point, it actually the room hypothesis will come back and give you a uniform bound at every point like that. So, how we're going to start next time, I guess, is we're going to make this assumption, 
And we're going to prove that error term of x to the half log squared x, only playing on the right of 1. Now, that may not surprise you. I mean, we have a proof already because this implies the Riemann hypothesis, and we saw the Riemann hypothesis implies that. But I want to build a technique that doesn't go into the critical strip or use zeros. Then what we're going to do is, well, OK, we, we're, we can't prove this. We, we can't prove the room hypothesis, unfortunately. Maybe we can prove a weaker version of this, something else to the k. And using that, well, we can do that. And using that, we can prove these other results. So that's what we'll do next time. And once we've done that, which hopefully won't take more than 20 minutes, then we'll move on to this more general technique using Perron's formula. OK, that's it. Any questions or comments? Yeah. Um, so, like in the proof of zero zero, um, so the the identity is different from the original one. If the, it's the playing instead of playing against type C, the two P is playing against two real characters. Uh, can you write that as a distance between between like two sequences? So to prove zero zero. zero. So instead of the cosine identity, you have the is it a L one chi one L S chi two L I chi one chi two. Can you rewrite that in the? The answer is yeah. That there is a formulation. Oh, there is. Can you prove zero? But it's not. Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. It, it takes a little bit of explanation. So um, I didn't really do a very good job talking about the distance function. Maybe I will next time, and then I can try and answer that question. I mean, there, there are some different issues to talk about, but I'll talk about at least one of them. <laughs> OK, Terry. So, so part of your philosophy, I guess, is, is to minimize the law of the space. Gone, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I, you know, I had plans to talk about how everything in Riemann's memoir comes into the proof of the prime number theorem, but. The only thing really that's left is zeta being analytic, having polar less equals 1.